Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Griffin. Um, I'm the general manager of Hardstaff Secure. And I'm going to talk to you about Operation London Bridge, um, the funeral arrangements for uh, Queen Elizabeth II from a personal perspective. So, Operation London Bridge. Cool. Operation London Bridge is actually one part of an overarching plan which together create a number of interlocking tactical operations to deal with the death in the royal household. It covers from the announcement of death through into the laying in state in St George's Chapel at Windsor Castle. Following the announcement of death, the initial proclamation takes place at St James's Palace in London, followed fairly soon after by a second one at the Royal Exchange in the City of London. Operation Marquee is the arrangements for the laying in state of the monarch in Westminster Hall. Uh, Westminster Hall, for those who don't know, is the oldest part of the Palace of Westminster. It's built in French stone by William the Conqueror to ensure a piece of France always remained in England. So the operation deals with the removal of certain hardware in New Palace Yard to facilitate movements to and from the hall and also the removal of the inner chorus line at Piers Car Park to enable the construction of the search facility, which is required to screen those wishing to view the laying in state. Operation Feather refers to the queue to protect those waiting to view the lying in state. Operation Unicorn is the Scottish elements relating to the movements to Holyrood Palace, subsequent movements to St Giles Cathedral, the lying in state, and the final movement to Edinburgh Airport for the repatriation flight. And the final piece is Operation Spring Tide, which is the first visits by the King to the four constituent countries that form the United Kingdom. So we'd have seen he went obviously to Scotland, uh, England to the Parliament, went to Wales, went to Northern Ireland. Okay, the planning timeline then. From a personal perspective, this has been on my planning agenda for the last 12 years. As FIPO in Surrey and Sussex Police, I was responsible for the emergency plans to activate to deal with local arrangements when this event occurred. Whilst I was um, responsible for the, M once I became responsible for the MBA, again still with the police, I worked with H2S2, which was a joint venture which included task staff barriers. And with my then colleague, Russ Phillips, who's here with me today, we designed the initial protection required for the gathering crowds for all the operations in Edinburgh, Windsor, and London. That was back in 2017. Together, we reviewed most hypotheses, including the repatriation by royal train with an overnight stop and an additional lying in state. In 2020, having switched to the private sector, I took on responsibility to revise the initial planning as the whole plan had dynamically changed over time. And certain topographical features where measures had been put in place had also necessitated a redraw of the layouts across London. When I saw the Queen had moved to Balmoral, I took more interest than usual in the news. People in the know kind of knew that that would be her dying wish. If her health was failing, she'd want to go to Scotland. So in early September, I was on a walking holiday in the UK with my wife and our dog, and as the week progressed, I could sense things were developing, and I made the decision to return home early. My wife had always understood that when London Bridge fell, I would be going to work for the foreseeable. So after breakfast, on Thursday the 8th of September, we started the four-hour drive home. I almost made it home when the news broke of the death, and I was straight to work from my office. I organised a meeting with our senior team to brief them on our expectations and all non-essential work ceased. We focused in on delivering Operation Bridge. We scheduled two commonly recognised information picture meetings, which we would call a CRIP, daily to ensure that the team players internally knew exactly what we were doing and what the next 12 hours had entailed for us and we had one meeting scheduled each day with the National Barrier Asset Manager to ensure we aligned with the workload that they actually had from the gold strategic objectives and from the silver tactical plans to ensure all of that was being met. At an early stage, we worked through the known timeline 
and built in a day off for all staff towards the end of the first week's activity. This was necessary as I knew our role didn't end on the day of the funeral, as everything we put in place would have to be removed afterwards. Okay. The event timeline itself. So this is kind of the known timeline that all police forces and those involved in this have been working to. So for those who were in the know, D was always the day that death would be announced, and D plus 10 would be the day of the funeral. And other things would occur throughout that period. When it was conceived, it was assumed, and we all know what assume stands for, the announcement of the death would be the first thing in the morning. So death would happen following an overnight demise. The reality, of course, is with modern media, death occurred during the day, the announcement was made late afternoon, and then the confusion about which day was D ensued. And that was debated long into Thursday evening before it was finally agreed that Thursday wasn't D, but Friday was. So that, from our point of view, meant a complete change in timelines and actually bought us effectively another 12 hours. So for us, D meant get a team to London to deal with Op Marquee and organise additional teams to commence the installation of the National Barrow Asset following that shift. It also meant get a team to Edinburgh to deal with protecting the crowds for Op Unicorn. Fortunately, I have great people around me and together we covered off all tasks set on D, including getting a team heading north to deal with the first four days in Scotland. We started building the secure footprint to enable the removal of the protective elements around the Palace of Westminster. On D plus one, we dealt with the two major proclamations, commenced the Op Feather Cube protection build, and we continued building the HVM footprint required for the final D plus 10 arrangements. We had teams working around the clock to deliver the requirements in London and Windsor and dealt with the dynamic changes required as the crypt changed. This continued throughout and included sending a team to Cardiff to prepare for the Op Spring Tide uh, uh, meeting with the King and the repatriation of the coffin through RAF Northolt. So Operation Feather, that was the protection of the queue. You got my slide up there, yep. Um, Effectively, that queue was going to head from, hopefully those at the front can see it, uh, from Piers Car Park over Lambeth Bridge and then head northeast along the embankment. And uh, it had been planned to end at London Bridge. We'd actually wrecked that whole route. We had drawings of what needed to be in place to provide that protection. So it's effectively the orange line on my plan. In March, the police had carried out a study to increase the queue back to Southwark Park. That hadn't been shared with us, and they were further considering a completely new direction for the queue to take it to Battersea Park. The reality was the additional measures had to be improvised on the hoof to get to Southwark Park, where the queue rapidly reached and people joined it, unless you were on breakfast TV. So by D plus 10, the above footprint was in place to enable the Metro Police to have a sterile environment to move the many VIPs attending the funeral in relative safety. Concurrently, we created a sterile zone for the final procession through Windsor, which encompassed the perimeter of the Royal Estate. So by D plus 10, hard staff had installed 58 hostile vehicle mitigation gates, 206 barges, 25 walling units, 692 metres of concrete reblock temporary vehicle restraint system, 389 quick movable blocks, 2,000 plus movements of pitagon in and out, 140 metres of surface guard had been deployed. And remember, what went in had to come out. So for us, our last shift was Monday the 26th of September, 19 days after we first started on this operation. So, to close, 
If you look at these things, you should also self-reflect. If you own or have responsibility for a plan, you have to know it verbatim. Don't get possessive. All planners know that a plan never survives the first confrontation with the enemy. Change is inevitable. You've got to prepare for it and expect it. Plan resilience for all roles early on. Nobody can keep going indefinitely. A team is only as strong as the weakest link, so make sure it isn't you. Make sure all your stakeholders for your plan understand it, know what's going to occur, when, where, and most importantly, why. I can't emphasize the need for clear communication enough. Ensure people understand what's being communicated and ultimately, it's the age-old saying, there are no stupid questions. Manage the expectations of your existing customers. They need to understand that priorities have changed and their task has moved down the pecking order. In reality, everyone we dealt with fully understood our position and we met no resistance. And share the workload. Sometimes it's hard to find time to actually break off from the task you're doing and brief someone else to undertake another task on your behalf. It needs to be done. It's an investment in time that reaps benefits all round. You've got to empower your teammates who are at your disposal to get the best from them.